It's finally time to tackle that tank anxiety that you've been having. Since Endwalkers is coming out, we wanna start getting you ready to do some tanking for the new expansion. Hey guys, my name is Stefan Ash and I have another Final Fantasy practical guide for you. In this video, we're gonna be going over all things tanking in Final Fantasy. This guide's purpose is to give you a beginner's understanding of tanking in order to build confidence and squash that tank anxiety. These are just my personal opinions, and if yours differs, that's great. This is not a perfect tanking guide for advanced players. This is a practical breakdown of how to tank in order to allow new players to even attempt it, as it can be really overwhelming. This is going to be a similar setup to my practical healing guides on my channel, so if you want to learn how to get over your heal anxiety, these videos are for you. This video is going to have a ton of knowledge bombs in here, so don't feel overwhelmed if you don't get it right away. Practice makes perfect, and rerunning dungeons you already know always helps build a lot of confidence. At the end of this video, I'll show you a dungeon run applying all these methods that we're about to go over so you can see firsthand how these can be effective in your tanking journey. Remember, if you get any value out of this video, then limit break 3 that subscribe button down below. Let's jump into the video. Let's first go over general basics of tanking that is true for all tanks. Enmity. I can never say that word right. This is your aggro stance. All tanks have a skill that will trigger their tank stance. In 4-man content, you should always have this turned on. Never turn it off in a dungeon. 8-man content, which you have 2 tanks, you can simply just ask who wants to be main tank or off tank. This means one tank will take charge or who will pull aggro and the off tank will grab ad spawns and just DPS. As long as you're the only tank, keep it on at all times. Tanks have rotations. Unlike their healer counterparts, tanks do have DPS rotations with multiple abilities. Albeit not very complicated, but there is a process to follow. Because of this, you'll have to take the time to understand their damage rotation. That being said, it won't take very long and just by looking it up and applying it at the practice dummies, you'll get it in no time. There are many resources out there of where to learn rotations. Again, tanking rotations are simpler in my opinion than DPS ones. All tanks have defensive cooldowns. Under role actions, tanks share these cooldowns. This is great as you only need to understand these specific skills once as they are the same for every tank. Each tank job also has their own specific defensive cooldowns that are related to the job. These are not a part of your rotations as they are situational when you're taking damage. Goals. Your number one goal as a tank is to hold aggro for enemies. This means that all the enemies should be attacking you at all times. If you're an 8-man content or 24-man content, then of course you have two or three other tanks, so this doesn't necessarily apply. But what still applies is that if any of your DPS or healers are taking damage from adds attacking them, you should be grabbing those. It is your job as the tank, and I just really wanted to emphasize that. This is not including, of course, specialized dungeons or trial mechanics, but those are very few and far between, and someone will usually explain those to you. The last important tip that changed the tanking game for me is adjusting your UI screen. Without doing this, I don't find tanking to be as successful and a little more improbable. In settings, under HUD layout, under current UI element, click on here and search for target info, and then click the cog settings next to it. This will take you to the UI element settings. Here is where the huge adjustment comes and helps make tanking make sense. You'll want to display target info independently. This will separate HP, progress, and status bar. HP is the health of the target, progress bar is the action or abilities being casted by the target, and status is the status effects applied such as dots, debuffs, etc. You can lay these out that make sense for you, but just to give you a reference, I place target HP to the middle right corner of the screen as I like to see the HP as often as possible. The progress bar is the number one UI element you want to start recognizing as that's the one that will let you know when a tank buster is coming, AOE, etc. as you start learning the abilities of the bosses. This is why I place it to the right of my character and the left of the HP bar and increase the size to something that makes sense for my screen. Status, I just place underneath HP. This is the adjustment here, which is just going to allow you to learn the tanking patterns, move names, and reused moves from boss to boss, as that happens pretty often in Final Fantasy. Now that we've covered the important part, let's jump into the leveling content with the tank. I will cover specific tank abilities later on in this video, but for the most part, the core of each tank is exactly the same. 
Let's jump into your first dungeon. We're gonna break down your first dungeon as the tank as this really is the meat and potatoes of tanking. This is going to set you up to expand upon your foundation for tanking by adding in more abilities as you level up, but the goal does not change when tanking in dungeons. You have your regular GCD combo, your AOE abilities, defensive cooldowns, and keeping aggros. These are my four main categories of tanking. You will want to begin each dungeon by turning on your tank stance. This is crucial that it never gets turned off while you're maining the tank in 4-man content. As you run forward and pull your first mob, you'll begin with your AoE ability. Well, why not your range ability? Don't worry, we'll go over that soon. Once you have all your enemies aggroed, you'll want to pop one of your defensive cooldowns. Continue AoE abilities until two or less enemies to which Sprouts can still use AoE to make sure to keep aggro or work towards single target GCD combo on each enemy. Once the trash mob is slain, you will continue on to the next trash mob. A really big tip here that I feel bad for sharing but is super important and needs to be said, don't run around while you're tanking. As a tank, you have super high defense and defensive cooldowns. You want to avoid the orange telegraphs, but one of the things you want to work on is moving as little as possible after you've pulled. The reasons being as many of the melee DPS have positionals, ninja can drop stationary AoEs, healers can drop their healing bubble, and the list really does go on. If you obsessively move, then you're not allowing the maximization of your teammates abilities, which is the whole point of you tanking to allow your teammates abilities to hit the enemy. I only bring this up because I've had a few players I played with who thought they were kiting, which means to attack and move away as you're attacking to avoid damage. In many MMOs, this is a thing, but not in this one. And you have a group of four and a DPS are having to chase enemies around and can't land their attacks, then it's not really effective. Yes, I have seen this happen in dungeons. At lower levels, you'll want to use one to two defensive cooldowns at all times during combat unless on cooldown. At minimum, one you will never really want to pop all of them at once as many trash mobs and bosses go longer than the durations of the cooldown. So even spreading will allow for more damage mitigation consistently throughout the fight. Already we're going to jump into personal pro tip number one and that's that I personally don't use my range enmity ability or aggro ability as the initial pool. Many new players end up doing this but it's actually easier to just run up and use your AoE ability. The reason being is that when you're running forward and you use your aggro ability long range, you'll be able to aggro only one enemy and then have to wait on cooldown until you can use your AoE ability. That is because your aggro range ability resets your GCDs. What ends up happening majority of the time is that your healer has casted either regen or shield on you, as they should after you pull, but if you only aggroed only one enemy, the healer's ability could pull aggro from the rest of the enemies that you did not hit. I've seen players pull with provoke as well. As long as you can get all the enemies in one hit, do what works for you. In the many hours I've played of tanks, I just find that running up soft aggroing, which just means getting in proximity and then AOEing seems to be 90% better most of the time. And yes, I said AOEing, A-O-E-I-N-G. It is a verb. With these two tips, this is the basics of dungeon pooling and practically does not change all the way up to end game. As you level up, you will gain more and more abilities to which I've created a video, a tank comparison guide that I'll link down below or above to fully understand the tank roles. Let's talk about tanking mini bosses and bosses in dungeons. When you come to bosses, this will be a little different than pulling trash mobs. First off, we don't need an AOE combo here as it's only one enemy. This is where the rotation comes into play, which I won't be covering here for each tank as it's really in depth and there's many guides out there already talking about that. For the actual change, here you can use your range aggro ability or you can use provoke. You'll want to pull the boss to the middle of the arena 90% of the time. As you pull the boss and the boss runs to you, you'll then want to angle the boss away from the group. This is just standard tanking procedure as you don't want any tank busters or wide area effect attacks to hit the party. The second reason is that you want the melee DPS to be hitting the boss in the rear position as the boss has less chance of blocking and takes more damage as well as it allows DPS with positionals to set up their rotations. 
The same concept here is that you want to move the boss as little as possible. We'll be avoiding orange telegraphs and if you change your UI, as I told you, you'll start seeing the boss's progress bar for their attacks. This is very important as a tank to understand what ability is coming next, whether it's a tank buster or something you need to use a defensive cooldown for. Pro tip number two, you only have to avoid the orange telegraph, not the actual move. As you tank more and more, you will see this consistently as long as you avoid visual telegraphs and move, you will not be damaged by it. Of course, near the end game, you will see less telegraphs in specific content, but casually, most of the time, there is one to avoid. I have decided to do one tank guide instead of separate for the mere fact that the first part of this video does not change no matter what tank you're on. The foundation is the same and only actual rotations will differ. Let's go over the tanking abilities roles that each tank shares. Be aware that this is just role actions. This is not even including each tank having a few defensive cooldowns specific for that job. Comment down below if you want a more in-depth guide to that specifically. First off, we have Rampart, which reduces damage taken by 20% for 20 seconds and has a recast timer of 90 seconds. This is usually your go-to ability as it's one of the earliest ones you get. In early content, players are keen to hold on to this since you have so few little cooldowns. This is not meant to be held on to. Just pop this after pulling one or two trash mobs to help mitigate that damage. It will be on cooldown before you know it. Next up, Low Blow. Attacks that stuns the target for 5 seconds with a recast timer of 25 seconds. This one has quite a few uses. One in particular in lower level content in a very specific dungeon. Bonus points to anyone who can guess which dungeon I'm talking about in the comment section. When enemies and trash mobs are going to cast a wide range AoE attack, a lot of the time you can use this to stun them so they don't. The reason being as most players have to run all the way out of the AoE and then back in, which of course, as we know, is a huge waste of DPS time. Here's an example of that now. Since we use low blow, everyone doesn't have to run out of it and we can continue on with the dungeon at a quicker pace. Be aware most bosses can't be stunned. This is primarily for trash mob AoEs and out in the world story play. Provoke. Places yourself at the top of enmity list, I can never say that word, for one enemy with a recast timer of 30 seconds. The huge piece of advice here is that this is not meant to be part of the rotation. Many players who come from other MMOs bring this as part of the rotation to hold aggro. This is not necessary in Final Fantasy XIV since we do have a tank stance, which as long as you're hitting your enemy, you should be at the top of the aggro list no matter what. This is super useful for ranged enemies that you don't want to have to run to or any enemy getting left behind and just out of range. So you don't have to pull the whole entire mob over to that ranged enemy. As well as this does not affect your GCD cooldown, so you can use this while still using your GCD combos. Interject. This one was confusing for me for a long time and I, I didn't really understand the purpose of this ability until in later content in Boja. This interrupts the use of a target's action with a recast timer of 30 seconds. When playing in dungeons, you will run, you will see the enemy have a glowing red cast bar or pulsing in very particular abilities. You would use interject at that point. Don't be concerned with this ability as it happens literally every few hours of gameplay. You will not run into this often. It can be a little of a pain at first to figure out, but once you do, you'll start recognizing it right away. Reprisal. Reduces damage dealt by nearby enemies by 10% with a recast timer of 60 seconds. This is going to be pretty much a main defensive cooldown paired with Rampart or one of your other specific tank abilities. In lower level dungeons, you can pair these up, but Reprisal will be ready 30 seconds before Rampart. Best used when you just pull or are stationary, usually have two trash mobs since it will hit more enemies and will mitigate more damage. Love this ability overall and should be used often. Arms Length. Now this is the most underrated ability of all time. Most people use this for the purpose of canceling out knockback effects, which are pretty prevalent in the game. But this ability is king for trash mobs, though it does have a long recast timer of 120 seconds. 
When casted, anyone who hits you within 6 seconds will have slow applied to them for the next 15 seconds. Slow status effect increases attack delay, weapon skill delay, and spell recast timers. This does not affect movement speed. I love using this on the first big pools in order to get it on cooldown as quickly as possible. This paired with Ramper is a pretty good damage mitigation which allows you to hold on your cooldowns for the next few trash pools. Generally, it's a great idea to place all of your tank roll actions in the same place for each tank so you get used to using them frequently and becoming muscle memory. Last but not least is Shirk, which diverts 25% of aggro to target party member. I will be honest that I only play tanks in casual content settings and not in Savage or Extreme, so I have very little use of this ability. Even in casual 8-man content or 24-man content, very rarely, if at all, do I use this. It simply transfers some aggro to a fellow tank, which is useful in some endgame mechanics when you as the main tank get the debuff and your fellow tank needs to take the tank buster or you'll die. If you're casually playing, I wouldn't worry too much about this ability. As promised, let's jump into a dungeon so then you can see how these methods can be applied to your personal tanking journey. So let's talk about dungeon runs. We're gonna queue into the stone vigil as an example. And this is a really good example to show you that not everything's gonna go perfectly every single time, especially as you're learning to be a tank. When you first queue in, you're gonna wanna turn on tank stance, which for Paladin is Ire Will, and a little hi hi in the chat box. As you run forward, you're going to AOE your first trash mob. See that I did not use my range aggro ability. That for me, I honestly believe that just do running up and doing an AoE is simpler than doing a range ability or a provoke. With all the trash mobs stationary, you now then use reprisal and a OGCD defensive cooldown. This is practically the basics of pooling and it's really not going to change. Things could happen and monsters can be out of range where you don't pull them and it kind of messes up the flow of things, but just thinking on your feet and just understanding your abilities will solve 95% of these problems. The next thing I wanna highlight is the movement. As you can see, an orange telegraph popped up. I simply moved out of it and then moved right back into place in order to not allow the mobs to move too quickly. This is really important as a tank because as you pull and mobs are moving, DPS can lose damage. So you wanna do as little movement as possible while still avoiding the telegraphs. Only have to avoid the telegraph. Once a telegraph has disappeared, you can move back to that spot even if the ability is still happening you're not going to get hit or take damage as long as you were not in the telegraph moving on to our first boss pool i start the encounter with a provoke and then immediately turn the boss around the reason that this is standard practice is that most bosses have aoe attacks that can hit the entire party this specific dungeon has a mechanic where the boss angles himself towards a DPS and uses a wide range AOE ability. So as a DPS, you need to understand that where the tank is positioning, where you need to be positioned, and the orientation of the boss. But as soon as the boss does his AOE ability, he then moves right back to the tank and where the tank is located because of the tank stance and the tank having enmity. All in all, tanking can be overwhelming, but I hope with this guide, you can get on your way to tanking like a pro in no time. I want to give a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters for you really keep this channel afloat and protect me from the ever-changing YouTube algorithm. If you get any value out of this channel and have considered supporting, you can go to my link tree down below and find out more information on how to support there. You can also connect with me on my social medias, but if you want to keep watching Final Fantasy tutorials, then you can click here.